many of you know what a robot looked like 50 years ago? Well, this is Shaky. It's a robot developed at Stanford. And we just celebrated Shaky's 50th birthday. Now, if I challenge you to think about a robot 50 years into the future, what pops into your head? Maybe one of these guys. C-3PO, R2-D2. But if we're talking about robots that are at work every day, right now, then we're probably talking about something more like this. Factory robots building cars. Pretty impressive, right? But I know what you're thinking when you see impressive factory robots. Deep down inside, you're secretly thinking, Where's my robot? <laughs> I want a robot to cook for me, to clean for me, to do my laundry. I mean, these robots are building a Tesla. Why can't we have Rosie yet? <laughs> right? Am I right? So as someone that is just as excited as you about having a personal robot in my house helping out, Today, I'm going to try to answer that question for you. So first, we'll lay out a few facts to set up the problem, and then we'll get into a demonstration. Now, one of the biggest challenges facing the field of robotics and artificial intelligence is figuring out how to get robots into human environments. How do we put a robot in an elementary school to clean up? How do we get a robot into your kitchen cooking dinner? And that might come to a, as a surprise to you, because, after all, we have robots doing really complicated things, like building airplanes. We've even put robots on Mars. So what's the big deal about putting a robot in my kitchen? What's the problem? We are the problem. <laughs> Humans. Humans create this level of dynamics and uncertainty that make it a, a much different problem for the robot. So let's think about it. That robot building the airplane, we can write down a plan. We can write down exactly what that robot's supposed to do. Every single day, it does the same thing. But now we come over here to the kitchen. What's the plan? What do we write down? What is it that that robot's going to do every single day that this, that's the same? I mean, you've got kids throwing stuff on the floor, the dog's going by, people are passing dishes back and forth. This is a dynamic situation. The robot has to be spontaneous and figure out what to do as it's going. So this is exactly the problem that I work on in my lab with my students. We're interested in getting robots to work in human environments, interact with people. Over the last several years, we've been developing a system called Cadence with the explicit goal of dealing with some of the dynamics and uncertainty that come with social interaction. So let's step over here, and I'd like to introduce you to Curie. So Curie is a robot in my lab, and today Curie is going to give us her best Rosie the Robot impression and help me demonstrate how we build social collaborative robots. Now, Kiri and I are having some people over tonight, so we have to clean up this table, and we're going to team up to get that done. We've got some trash that needs to be put in that recycle bin over there, some kids' toys that can go into this toy bin, and some kitchen items for the shelf, and some flowers to put out. Now, if you came into our lab, uh, we would just explain to you the kind of commands so that the robot can understand, and you'd have a pretty straightforward interaction. But for you today, I'm going to stop things at several points along the way and explain how we make things work. So let's get started. Curie, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can. OK, we've got a lot of work to do. Let's clean up the table. OK. I think we need to put things away and put trash in the bin. Great. Now, one of the first things that you notice about Curie is that this robot has eyes and a face. And that ends up having a huge impact on the overall interaction. So the first demonstration I want to show you 
is the difference that it is when the robot uses the eyes when it's acting versus not. So we're going to have Curie pick up these two pieces of trash, but the first time we won't use the eyes, and the second time we will. So let's see the first one. Now here, the robot's doing a completely reasonable arm action. Oops. <laughs> I'll help you out there. <laughs> but when she's staring straight ahead, maybe that's why she didn't pick up the bottle, but she didn't, doesn't look very lifelike. Let's see what it looks like when the eyes are engaged. Now the robot is using the head and eyes to indicate where she's going to be acting and when she's going to be acting. And this does a lot for the human partner because now I can see what she's doing before it's going to happen. So that lets me anticipate the robot's actions, and that helps us coordinate our behavior. So now we've seen the robot do a couple of solo actions, but this time we're going to start getting, getting to work doing things together. So this time, Curie and I are going to reach for the same object at the same time. So this is something that happens a lot when you're working together with somebody. And just like the eye gaze demonstration, I'll show you two different versions. So we'll see what it's like when the robot's only paying attention to itself and doesn't really take me, the social partner, into account. And then we'll see a version when she does. So let's see the first version. Now here, the robot has to decide what to pick up, make a plan, and start executing it. And if I go in to interact with the same object, the robot doesn't really care. She just keeps going, and she's going to finish doing what she had in mind. But if, on the other hand, she's taking into account that there's another person in the environment trying to work at the same speed on the same task, if I reach into this object that she's going for, then she'll interrupt herself and make a plan to do something else that's also going to achieve our task. So this notion of collaboration has to come into the robot's lowest levels of motion planning. It has to constantly kind of monitor the environment and monitor the human partner and be spontaneous and be willing to interrupt its plan. So this notion of interrupting yourself and, and interrupting your actions and being spontaneous comes into account when the robot's acting, but also when the robot's speaking. So let's get Kiri talking. Curie, are we going to serve any food at the party tonight? Yes. Cheese and veggies are ready in the kitchen. Great. What about toast? Can we serve toast? Well, we can't serve toast because we don't have any artisanal bread or locally sourced butter and jelly, and the farmer's market is not open until Saturday. But there's another market that is open today. But I do not think they actually have artisanal bread though they may have the locally sourced okay. butter, or either okay. the jelly, okay. and okay. also wheat. OK, OK, OK. So what you're saying is we can't serve toast. Wonderful. So what's great is that the robot was paying attention and being willing to be interrupted. And this actually happens all of the time when two people are speaking. You know, you don't wait for silence before you start talking. Conversation is very fluid and dynamic, and you kind of pass it back and forth all the time. So we have to explicitly program the robot's speech system to have that sort of responsiveness and reactiveness. Now, one of the things it, when we're doing a task like this, or a lot of the things that we do in our lab with these collaborative tasks, a lot of the times the robot has, the thing it wants to talk about is asking questions about the task itself. You know, the robot might need to clarify something. And so the next demonstration I want to show you is the difference that it is when the robot can use words versus words and gestures to ask a question. So let's see what it's like when the robot just uses words to ask a clarifying question. Is the green object 17 inches from the table edge, a flower pot? OK, well. I'm not sure which of these two objects is 17 inches from the tabletop. I probably have to get out my tape measure to really answer that question. But let's see how different it is when we let the robot use gestures as well. So 
So now instead of a complicated object description, she can just point. Is this the flower pot? Yes, it is. And that was a much more reasonable way to ask that question. So we have to have a decision process running on the robot where any time Curie wants to communicate something, there's a decision that has to be made about whether it's going to do it with words or with gestures or some combination of the two. OK, Curie, I think we're almost done here. Let's do, let's set out our flowers. You can take this. Now, as we're going through this whole task, the robot is constantly monitoring the whole workspace and trying to decide if we're done or if there's anything else to do. There we go. I think we're finished. I hope I did well. Yes, thank you, Curie. You did very well. Now, this demo gives you a little peek under the hood at how we build social collaborative robots to interact with humans and around humans. And, you know, obviously, Curie's not ready to go home with you today, but one day, robots are going to be a part of your everyday life. And this is a big myth about the field of robotics, that we are all mad scientists tucked away in some lab building Terminator robots that are going to take over the world. I mean, I think three people asked me that today already. <laughs> but there, nothing could be further from the truth. The field of robotics is filled with innovative thought leaders that are toiling away hours of programming robots to do amazing things that are going to have a huge social impact. Whether it's robots that are going to clean up after your kids, or robot assistants in your classroom, or at your office, or a robot at home with an older adult that's helping with mobility or, med or medication management. Another way to think about it is this. In the not too distant past, Having a cell phone meant that you had a satellite phone in a huge backpack. And the idea that everyone would carry them around was ridiculous. And now the idea that you don't have a phone on you is ridiculous. So we're still at the backpack stage of personal robots. But we're going to get there. And these machines are going to change our lives in an exciting way. Thank you. <laughs>